Yes, guys, it's first word, man, and this is five, and this is our weekly round of everything, all things football. We've got a few cheeky guests for you. Let's get into it. So we've got our first three guests on today. Joel, aka Mr. Cheeky Sports, is on. You've seen me do some work with Flav, the Spurs contingent, the Spurs man here, all or nothing in the background. We've got Mr. Liverpool himself, Mr. Cal Freezy. We don't want no gloating, man. Uh, no, nah, you know what? After the last game, I don't know if there's going to be too much gloating. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't that impressed. Okay, let's start with Liverpool. Anyway, right? Liverpool, yeah. your team. The new season's here. Champions of the country. Champions mm-hmm. of Europe at the moment. Still, the best team I think in Europe. What's going to happen this season? What are your, what are your expectations? Um, what are your fears? Maybe going into the new season. And obviously, after the first game, where are you at? Yeah, so obviously we had the uh, the thrilling game against Leeds that uh, any neutral would have absolutely loved. But as a Liverpool fan, um, it quite literally had me on the edge of my seat. But uh, Salah came to the rescue and uh, managed to bag a hat trick, which was uh, fantastic. I think it's probably one of the best games I've seen him have in a long time. Um, I can't quite say the same for uh, the back line, though. Uh, I thought uh, the defence was was shaky. Um, I think the for me the only good player. Or, or the only player that had a good game, I should say, was probably Robertson. I thought he played quite well. Um, Do you see a yeah. repeat this year? I mean, because when I, when I speak about champions, uh, not any team can win a one-off championship, but I, repeating it is the hard thing because you become that team with a target on your back. Every game, everyone's up for it. And I used to play in the game sometimes, and come off, or even during games, I'd say to some strikers, oh, if you don't play this hard, I watched you last week on match of the day, you weren't, you weren't driving around like this. Yeah, no, I mean, it's going, to be, it's going to be interesting to see. I think, you know, we've obviously still got a little bit of time left in the transfer window. But, you know, I, I think we should be challenging for it this season. I'd like to see Liverpool make a signing. I'm desperate for Thiago to come through. Um, but I, I don't know whether that's going to happen. Uh, you know, there's talks about um, the only way that happens if, is, if uh, Juan Aldum goes to potentially Barca. So, um, yeah, I'd like to see some signings, but I know our owners aren't quite... Um, on, on the level of Man City, so I'm not expecting them to go and throw around 100. Your, your owners are on no level at the moment, man. For, let alone Man City, yeah. Because how can a top team like you, yeah? When you look at the big teams, they've been able to do it, do it back to back, and every year they add that little something just to push mm. on a little bit. The Origi trick ain't gonna work for three seasons in a row, you know, Cal. Mm. We bought like Berbatov. We done. We won the league back to back. Tevez. Rooney, Ronaldo, and then we buy Berbatov, like who's the best, I mean, the best, probably the best other striker in the league at the time, to add to that and make a quartet. I think it's a big, it's a big thing for a change room. It's not only about the quality, it's about what it says to that change room, I think. And it's it's meant the mental side of it, the effect it has on the change room is huge. And if you don't add, I just think sometimes it can go stale. Rio, can I ask about what's that mentality like in terms of like Liverpool? They, they should have won it the year before, almost a miracle that City did it. They won, again, they won, it, won it this year. How, how important is like, the mentality going into that, that, that next season, given the fact that they've done it already? What, is, is that important? Do they need to be motivated in a different way? Yeah, complacency is your absolute enemy. You can't have the complacency creeping in at any point. And I think that's what Sir Alex Ferguson was great at. He, he had a fear of that. And he, if he ever identified that, listen, I went into the training ground here, yeah? And Dwight York, who won the treble uh, a couple of years before, was on fire, him and York, uh, Coley up front, etc. And I walked around the training ground on my first day with him. And I remember walking up the stairs and Sir Ferguson walked out of his office and saw us and went, all right, boys, hey, morning. And we both said morning, me and Dwight York. And I was talking to him for at breakfast with him. Went out onto the training pitch and as me and York, I think, walked out, he called me over and said, we are... Rio, come here. And Sir Alex Ferguson, so the respect levels are crazy anyway. And, and you kind of look like a head teacher calling you at school on your first day. So I walked over and he went, um, do you want to be here for a long time? I said, yeah. I said, I want to win everything. I want to do as well as I can, boss. Um, he said, well, the first thing you should probably think about doing is not hanging around with him because he ain't going to be here. I said, wow. I said, what, what, what? He said, he, said he's, he, he was unbelievable, won everything, but complacent now yeah and when he said that to me and just hit home where that no one's safe at this club no matter what you've done he's, he, Dwight you was walking around Manchester at that point as the king of Manchester because he'd done the treble and been an integral part of that but you start letting standards slip maybe or the intensity is not the same at the training ground you've got to go 
And I'll, that, forever, that, that conversation stayed with me for the rest of my career at Man United. That, that fear of being pushed out the door because I wasn't as intense as I was at the beginning. So you climb the mountain to get there, which Liverpool have done, to, to keep going and to at least stay on that, that, that same trajectory. You've got to add people that are going to bring that new vibe, that new intensity, that something different that people are going to go, well, I've got to get to that level. And, and he's done that, Van Persie. Berbatov, all these type of players were part of doing that. And I think Liverpool, I think like you say, if they add Thiago Cal, they, that is a massive player, just won the Champions League, probably one of the best in terms of conductors in the game at the moment. It'd be huge. No, yeah, I think we also, we're also just in need of uh, squad depth. I mean, uh, I, don't, I, I assume you guys have been watching the, the, the All or Nothing series. I mean, you watch when Son and Kane went, uh, you know, two of you know, Spurs' best attacking players. You know, I, I can't help but think, imagine, you know, Salah, Mane end up getting injured around the same time or whatever. I mean, who the hell is that? What squad depth have we got on to come on that's going to win us a title mm. again? You talk about spending, that moves us on nicely to someone like Chelsea. My old friend Frank is there. He's got a checkbook out. It's like he's playing real life football manager. How do you think Chelsea have done, boys, in the, in, in the window? Unbelievable. I don't think I've ever seen a transfer window quite like it. They've they've gone after the players that you wouldn't. Could you any of us? Anyone said they've got Werner, Havertz, even Ziyech. This kind of seems like a low key, even though he's a quality player. He's, he actually tore Tottenham apart over two legs in the Champions he's League. Tore Chelsea apart as well. He's a good, really, really good, good player. Uh, and then Chilwell, incredible for Leicester. Exactly the kind of left back I'd have dreamed of at Spurs. And and, and Chelsea are just like. Signing players with ease. And if you listen to Daniel Levy, he said signing players is, is, is difficult. It ain't for Chelsea, clearly. If you've got the money, Frank, you're willing to made it look, Frank has made signing players look like it's like the norm. Like, this is easy. Water for ducks back to me. This is nothing. That's it the does. way he made it look. Exactly. It does. And you, Werner, you know, part of the reason why he went there is because Chelsea was so willing to pay his massive wages, which is... Which is fair enough, you know. He, he's a great, great player, and it is a bit of a gamble. But if you want a player to come in, if you want to bridge that gap between Liverpool, uh, Man City, and where Chelsea were last year, or any of the teams chasing, you have to spend your way through it. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm talking selfishly here, but the difference in the way that Chelsea have done their business in this window compared to, say, my team, Man United, is uh, there's no noise, there's nothing going on. All you're seeing is bang, deal, little yeah. bit of talk, bang, deal, get, get it done. I'm, that's what's frustrating for me and for all the main United fans I talk about is Sancho was talked about months ago. Still not done. It's so frustrating. I'm, I'm not sitting here saying deals are easy to be done, but they are. It's Frank's showing and Chelsea is showing deals can be done if you put the money down the right, and it's, and it's, it's all done in the, in the right way. Yeah, listen, when it comes to Chelsea, massive respect, man, because as much as, you know, on the, on the banter side of things, like, you know, I get them. But to be honest with you, like, what Roman Abramovich has done, I feel like the whole situation he's had has just made him come back even more determined. And I thought he was finished. I thought he was going to, you know, slowly, you know, wither away into the into the background. But he's come back for force, man. And uh, I don't know how Frank Lampard has, you know, convinced him to to spend the way he has. I don't think Chelsea have spent like this since... Since Mourinho days, if I'm honest with you, remember Chelsea didn't haven't spent for a year. You know they've had a whole transfer window where they couldn't spend because of the ban. So he's really just spending 100. Well, how much they've done? Like 230, 240 million mm. like, over two transfer windows. That's not crazy for a club the size of Chelsea. It's just that it's just the status and the names of the players they've signed. What's impressive? Well, the money's play. less of an issue. An issue. But Havertz, you know, incredible player. We don't know just how good he is. He'll probably go on to do incredible things in his career. Werner, again, they've just made statement signings. And that's, that's what's impressive. Not the money they spent, the names they've got in. So making them statement uh, signings, does that mean that Frank has to finish above where he finished last season and maybe get a trophy? I think he needs to get top four. I think if he gets top four, he, he's got another, you know, he'll be fine for another year. But... Um... Yeah, it's for him. It's got to be top four. That I think that's the aim to, to get that consistently getting the the Champions League football. And then yeah, I think the season after that they're probably looking at trophies. I reckon because you know all these new players coming in, it's going to take a little a little while for them to all start gelling, integrating, starting to play the football that they all want to be playing. So uh, if they get a trophy this season, I think that's a massive that's a massive plus. But right now it's just got to be top four, top four, top four. Moving swiftly from that. To Arsenal, man. I watched Arsenal at Curran Cottage the other day against Fulham. And, man, it was a breath of fresh air from watching that team. I've always moaned about 
there's no one taking responsibility. The defenders don't defend well enough. Um, they, they were a bit wishy-washy. And they'd always come up against teams, with, especially like the teams where you expect them to win and, and fall flat on their face. The big teams they couldn't do the job against. Again, under Arteta, we are in a new world with Arsenal, it seems to me. Listen, double-barreled double barrel word, right? Non-negotiables, right? That is his main thing. When he first mm. came into the club, that's the first thing he says. And you know what? He stuck to his words. Even if it was Guendouzi messing about or whatever, even if it was Ozil. And that's been the difference. Beforehand, even at the end of Wenger's days, it was like we didn't know what was going on. It was a bit like in the All or Nothing documentary where Rose got vexed because Jose was pulling them out for not training well but he was saying there's people out here who don't train well and they still play that was our problem at Arsenal before there was a lot of people that weren't doing their job but they were still somehow finding themselves in a team or whatnot and you know what? at the end of the day when you do that you respect the manager less even if you're getting away with it and I think with Arteta it's simple you don't play well you're out you play well you're back in the team and do you know what else guys ruthless we're now getting in front of goal and people understand how important it is to convert. Fair play, the majority of it has been a Bamiyan, who for me is the best striker in the league at the moment. I don't want to hear no one saying anything. But besides that, the other players are chipping in as well, man. Like, and Lacazette is forcing himself back into the team. It's easy to say it's a Bamiyan. It's a Bamiyan because mm. he's getting the goals, yeah? But I think you look at the, the, the similarity between the goal in the community shield against Liverpool and you look at the goal against Fulham at the weekend, they were almost identical goals. And that, what that does is that reinforces again to those players. I can see him playing them two goals side by side to the team in a meeting and saying, listen boys, look, this is what we've been doing in training. And then for now, last two games now, it is coming to the fore on the pitch in the 90 minutes. And there's no better reinforcement for what he's trying to put to them tactically, but also as a manager in his ethos, that is the best way to get them to believe and to understand and say, you know what, I have bought into this now, I'm in. All we need is for Conky to open up that checkbook, brother, and, and, and bring in Thomas Party. And, and to be honest with you, I think we're there. Arsenal Football Club, it's been rocky out here. Do you know what I mean? The so who does Party, to, whose position does he take? Well, he, he's more of a defensive midfielder. And the reason why, the reason why he's, to be honest, for me, I would, you, I would have to sit down Shaka. Because even though I like Shaka and he's been brilliant, I'm sorry, bruv. If you're better than whoever's in the team and you're showing the great attitude, you have to start. And it's then mm. up to Xhaka to fight for his way back in. Do you know what I mean? And, mm. and that's the good thing about big teams. You can't... When you lot had Varon, Scholes, um, Keane... Mm. But, like, listen, that will work itself out. Do you know where I'm coming from? Like, whoever wants it will have it. I was even going to say, I know I'm going off tangent, it, I wanted to ask you something similar to what Flav asked you, Rio, when you were talking about um, being lazy, etc. How did you manage to keep out Gerard Piquet from that team? Because that, for me, that tells me that the competition has to have been so intense that you, you knew something that we didn't know. Do you know what I mean? For you to have gone out there and... Because that ain't easy, bro. No, you know what? It's weird because Gerard was... PK when he was at Man United wasn't the Gerard Piquet that we see at Barcelona now. We, we knew he had talent and we knew that this guy is going to he's going to do big things in the game but did I think that he would go on and do what he'd done? No, if I'm being honest. Definitely not in England. He played and what, what killed him a little bit is he played for, for United against Bolton when they had Anelka up front and Anelka scored off him a little bit and his game maybe just wasn't suited to the English, English way of playing. Um, I mean, if he were playing for Man City now, it'd be very different. He could play in that team, not a problem, because the way they play, they have the ball, etc. But I spoke to Alex Ferguson, who said he spoke to Pep Guardiola, and he said that, that one of the key things and fundamental things in that team at Barcelona was getting Gerard Piquet. He was somebody you could see who believed in his own ability. He just needed the opportunity, and the main night he weren't getting it. So he went and done what he'd done and absolutely blew it out of the park. But you've got to have that mindset. T talking about Pep there, what does Pep need to do this season? I mean, I'm not sitting this by any means saying that he's going to get the sack or anything like that because I don't think Pep, he's done too much to, to, to be given the sack. But was he brought in to win the Champions League, which he hasn't been able to do? And if he doesn't do that this year, what does that spell for him? He was brought in predominantly to win the Champions League. It doesn't matter what anyone says. Great. Centurions, we respect it. One of the best Premier League teams I've ever seen. 
And whether people like it or not, man like Manuel Pellegrini was winning the league as well. Do you know what I mean? So mm. for him, he's there to give the club the global brand. Do you know what I mean? Let me tell you how I know he's there to give the, the club a global brand. Because I remember the start of the season two years ago. He, when he first started, he, um, the season after he started at City, he said, yep, yeah, if I was at a bigger club, I would have got sacked. And none of the media caught that. I was just wow. like, did he really say that in a press conference? And yeah. he did. Do you know what I mean? So he, he was put there to help with the branding City. You know, they, they're very clever guys. This season is the first time. I was watching the, your coverage at BT Sport, yeah? And I'll tell you what, it's the first time that I'd seen from just people in general in football and fans where they started questioning. Hold on a second. Has he, has he got, is he the guy that we thought he was in Europe? Do you know where I'm coming from? And, and for the first time ever, I'm chatting to City fans and I can see within their eyes, they're doubting, man. If you had asked them last year, do you reckon they can win the Champions League? They would have said, yeah, of course, of course. But as it's going now, I feel like they, they feel like they, don't you agree, Flav? They might not, I mean, if they are, then they're, they're out of their minds. They, they, they paid their way to the point of, of becoming a, a, a globally a global elite team. Um, they've usurped to other clubs that have, have, have tried to do it in a different way, a more perhaps pragmatic and, and more sort of holistic way that in terms of football. Uh, and so for that reason, they don't get any grace from me. And I think from many fans, you win or you're, you're, you're a failure. That said, who are you going to get better than Pep Guardiola? Give, you've got to give him the time and the grace that he deserves. Mm -hmm. It's just that Man City are a different, they're mm -hmm. a different um, yeah. example. They're not mm -hmm. like a normal football club, and the, the way they've risen to the status they have done isn't normal. And, um, and for that reason, they don't deserve the same grace as the rest of the clubs. Yeah, no, I to, uh, I agree. I mean, I think you know you at least have to see them progress further than than what they did last season. It was disappointing the way they went out um, in the Champions League last season. And you know, same as Flav said, if they're if they're not winning the Champions League, they need to be winning the league um, for a manager like that. But at the same time, it's that you say, all right, okay, well, Pep's not doing that right. Let's get rid of him. Well, me personally, I can't name one manager that you're going to put in there and go, right, this man's going to do the job instead. There's mm -hmm. there's there's not a, there's not a manager out there, so. You know, it might even just be uh, an internal thing at Man City when it comes to these big knockout games. What, what's happening? Like, you know, they're making it to these knockout stages and they're just getting, you know, they're getting put out by teams that shouldn't be putting them out. So is it a, is it a, a mentality thing? Is it an internal thing that maybe the manager doesn't have quite as much control over? I don't know. But um, yeah, when it comes to these knockout games and it's almost like the pressure gets to them so much because, you know, the pressure is on Man City more than any other team to win the Champions League at the moment. And I just feel like it gets to them every time. That's a really good point you, you, you said there, Cowan, is that there's a lot more pressure and media attention on the fact that they haven't won the Champions League, especially under Pep. And I think that's something that filters through into the veins of the players and the management. And I think you've seen that in tactically the way he changes, etc. Knee-jerk reactions, it almost seems like, in the big occasions in the knockout stage of the Champions League, yeah. which contributed maybe to them not getting over that hurdle. And, and that goes down to the players. Players sense when the manager is not at his most comfortable. I mean, when Stoke Stokes, when we go to Anfield, he'd be talking to us about a game days before the game against them, much more intensely than he'd probably do with any other game of the season. So that automatically you know there's a big, big, big factor riding on this game. The rivalry is intense. The manager is bang on it. He's, he seems a bit nervous in the change room. If he's nervous in the change room or in, on the tactics board or in the meeting room before the game, we know that. And as players, if you go out feeding that, man, it's, it's, it's you, the manager's there to alleviate that pressure most, most of the time. If you can do that, it's difficult. But the players do feed off the, the tension and the emotions of the manager. And maybe that's something that does play into it. And, and we we're talking about Man City there. A Man City player I'd like to move on to really is, is Phil Foden. I know you guys love talking about the young players, Mason Greenwood as well. They got into a little bit of trouble over the weekend. What's your view on how they've one been treated, but the way forward for these boys uh, beyond this? And, and, and I spoke the other day on BT about it in that I feel these young kids need educating. It's more about educating them than actually vilifying them and, and making them the villains and dragging out more stories, which I saw the other day afterwards, which is not going to help these young players. It only goes to hinder them going forward. And I don't understand why the media would want to do something like that to these great young talents. Um, and where, where, where do you stand with these guys? 
I, that media don't care about the young talents. They don't care about anything. They are kids. They're kids in a fortunate position who are going to have opportunities like the ones that they're presenting themselves when they uh, go to Iceland. And like any young man, they're going to take advantage of that. It's not... It's Cal, a you've been there. You've done that, Cal. <laughs> hey, look, look, I don't blame them, right? Like, I, they made a mistake. I hope that they've learned from it. But these things are going to happen. Just like five seven, it's going to happen. They're young, they're kids, they're away somewhere, and they haven't quite thought about the consequences, and they've made a mistake. And, you know, I'd hope that they're not going to make that mistake again, and they've learned from it. But the way that the media have gone after them, and, you know, some of the headlines that I'm seeing, and then, like you said, some, some of the other stories that just really don't need to come up, and it's quite clear it's only been brought up because of the recent controversy. The only people they need to apologise to is their partners. That's, that's what they've done is wrong, right? They, they should apologise to their partners, and that's it. Yeah. Other than that, I'd be completely unrepentant. I think the media, as Cal said, the media, they love it, innit? This is what makes a, you know, a quite boring international break period. That's what gives it the spice, innit? Because to be honest with you, we should have been chatting about the Denmark game instead. But, you know what I mean? They love this story. In regards to it, um, to, to the both of them, I feel like, yeah, they did make, you know, a silly mistake. You know what I mean? For me, it's, it's more like, not that they really did it, and I'm not here condoning, but I just felt like, guys, it's your first call up. Chill out a little bit. You know what I mean? <laughs> if I'm, if I'm, if, if I'm, it was a bit see, mad. It was their first call up. I won't lie. That, that thought, was a bit mad. Yeah. I thought, and, and on top of that, yeah, from a, and this is from me a personal point of view. I just thought it was a bit sloppy. Like you're in your England tracky, like chatting to girls that ain't living the life. Like you're putting yourself out there a little bit. You got to be a bit smoother than that. But in regards <laughs> to them two, they'll they'll be all right because. You know, not to come here and start naming names, but I've seen the Steven Gerrards get in trouble in the beginning in their career. Frank Lampard, all them Maybe. guys there. Like, you, yeah. you, I mean, you even told me, Rio, you said that you moving to Leeds out of London was one of the best things you could have ever done because you was more focused there. You, know, you didn't have as much friends there. And so I feel like what those players have to do in order to be forgiven, guys, is win. Simple. Just play. When you win, which I believe both of those two players will win. I feel feel like Greenwood is what sensational talent. Like every week, he's making it harder for me to to back Martinelli instead of him. But right about now, it's a Greenwood thing all day long. Even mm. I'm going to that. That's the thing. That's what I think a lot of people say. Oh, because they're they it's their first England call up because they're so much in the headlines or they're in the, they're under the spotlight. They're at these big clubs. They're getting so much so soon that they should be able to make the right judgment. But they're, they're, they're 18, 19 years old, you know, 20 years old. What kid is doing that? I'll go back to you, Cal. You was, you've been successful at a young age, yeah? But you on, on a different platform, you've probably been able to do get away with a lot more because you aren't a, a footballer, maybe, and it's not as glaring in the public eye. But, but, but what I'm getting to is the fact that a lot of people are allowed to make mistakes at these ages because they're not in the spotlight. And so to say, sit here and say, oh, they should have and they could have done this, etc. I don't think it's realistic to, to, to imagine that and to expect that. But we've all made mistakes and some people obviously aren't in the spotlight. They make mistakes and they learn from them. So when they get 25, people aren't going to remember when you were 20 and you've done that, blah, blah. They, they've got away with it. It's fine. They've been able to get, we, we consider, uh, consider things and they've been able to then move on and then evolve as, as, as adults. And these guys are being afforded that. And I understand that because that's the business they're in. But that's why I go back to the point. This is about educating them, not making them out to be absolute villains. Yeah. Uh, just I, I, my, my, my education to, to them, if I was in a fortunate position to have to talk to them, I would just say don't really worry about what the press say. It's like the, press, the press are often the worst part about football, in my opinion, right? This is just my opinion. I don't have a, a, a massive amount of time for the football, football, football media, especially tabloid football coverage. Um, but you look at Jack Grealish. Like, look at Jack Grealish. He's photographed by some person on holiday, sold to the newspapers, all over the uh, uh, back pages and some of the front pages. He's passed out on the floor. Like, the first... From that point, he's become almost a darling of the league. Like he should be in that England squad, and um, it, and 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 he's transformed his career. The, the, the same thing can happen. What what Greenwood and Foden did, pals into insignificance, to being passed out on the floor in Tenerife or wherever he was, and look where Grealish has recovered to. There won't there won't be an issue unless they keep repeating it. Then then it is their fault. But this yeah. is a one off. Forgive them. Yeah. Let them play. Don't put them under spotlight because we've got two incredible talents to go along with the the other incredible talented players in that England squad. This could be a golden generation. Uh, uh, similar to the one we had before, if we just leave them alone and let them play. 
All right, that should lead us nicely to the last couple of quick questions that I've got for you guys, yeah? Who are going to be your breakout talents this year? Who have you got there? This is the guy I think will come out. I mean, I'd like to see... Well, I mean, I, w okay, I wouldn't... As a Liverpool fan, I wouldn't like to see this. Uh, maybe as an England fan, I would. But I'd like to see Greenwood kick on. Actually, but, well, actually, funny, just both of these players. I want to see Foden get more game time as well. Um, I think he, he, he's unbelievable. Um, it, that's in, ter in terms of youngsters, those are probably my two favorite. Obviously, you've got Martinelli. I don't know what you think and, and where you think he's going to fit into that um, Arsenal team. Um, but, you know, he's got, he's got a lot going for him. I guess... Um, You're not going to say Ryan Brewster, no? No Brewster? Well, I was actually going to say Elliot. Um, uh, Elliot, uh, you know, he's young. He, he's, he's even younger. Um, I'd like to see him from the Liverpool side of things uh, come through. Uh, we've obviously got Curtis Jones as well. It looks like, you know, with the lack of transfers, he could be uh, definitely be, be starting a few games at least this season. Um, so I'm excited to see that. Um, but yeah, I'd say those are probably the, the players that I'm keeping an eye on this season. Joe? It's got to be. I, I want to say Martinelli because I've I've got a lot of um, I've got a lot of love for that guy, man. The way he works, you know, what I mean, regardless of what manager he was playing under, he was showing a lot of uh, a lot of commitment to the club, man. So I, you know, I, I really want to see him kick on. I want to see Eddie and Ketty kick on as well because looking at his stats, he scored at every single level, and uh, hopefully he can do it at Arsenal. If I look across the league uh, in a holistic uh, point of view, I'm a massive fan. Believe. But not of Curtis Jones, you know, Cal. Um, I feel like that guy has taken the opportunity at the end of last season at Liverpool and he's just shown so much composure, so much trickery, so much everything. And I'm like, right, sometimes you've got good players that are sitting right underneath your nose right there. And, and you know, who knows? Like, we, we don't know. I, I, it's going to be hard for him to, to break into the starting 11. But I think he can have a very good year, to be honest with you. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he even got a call up at the end of it. Um, so I would say Curtis Jones, Martinelli, and if I was to go for one more, it's got to be man like Greenwood, man. Gunwood, that guy's just left foot, right foot, how you want it. Let me know. I love him, man. I can't lie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard to expand on anything else other than what you guys have said. Uh, Foden, Greenwood, uh, you know, uh, it, all I can talk about from with any authority is Tanganga's potential and. Um, the fact that we haven't signed the centre back, and it looks like Foyth might go, that they, he's going to trust in Tanganga. He just got a new contract. He came in and did really, really well, as we've seen from the documentary. Kept Rose out, a right-footed centre back playing in the left back position rather than Rose. Says quite a lot about how much, well, probably maybe how bad Rose has fallen, but also how much faith they have in in, in Tanganga. He looks really accomplished, really um, exciting on the ball. So I'm hopeful of seeing, seeing more of that just as a quick side. Our under-18, the Spurs under-18 uh, under side is insane. We've got six English and England internationals in that under-18 wow. side. So you're going to see some big things from them in the future if we can keep hold of them. OK. I'm about the same as you guys. Greenwood, Martinelli, uh, my two favourites who I've seen. I want them to produce. But it's difficult, man. It's like these clubs are spending so much money. You look at the Chelsea boys last year, all these young players coming through. Tammy Abraham's first day of the season and the sun. I mean, after having a season where he scored a good amount of goals for a young player first season, so Rhys James had an absolute fun. banger yesterday as well. His oh, goal yesterday, Bill. unbelievable! I yeah, love him. There's always another one I really like. Yeah. You see the boy Lam Lamptey, the left the right back for Brighton. Yeah, yeah, he just went from Chelsea, right? Yeah, yeah. I like so. him. Tenacious, tenacious. We talked about best young player. Who is your tip for best signing of the summer, guys? We'll go through the same order again. Cal, go on, mate. Oh, I'm gonna hate to say this, but I think it might be Werner. I think it might be him, and I'm going to yeah. be fuming if he just like <laughs> 25 goals or something. Yeah. For me, it's the same thing. It's Werner, bro. Like, I think, man, I'm sleeping or what, bro. You can't let those kind of quality. That's like the equivalent of you not just letting Ruud van Nistelrooy yeah, just slip to your rivals just, yeah. just for no reason. It's a joke, bro. It's a joke. But yes, yeah, Werner all day. Club? Uh, just to be different, I'm going to say Ziek, uh, only because. Yeah. He, he, he hasn't cost what those other players have cost. I know Werner is, he's on, it was 52 million release clause, but he's on like 300k a week. CX is on nothing near that. So I'm, I think he's going to do really well and stand out as, as one of their, their, their top players, even though, as I said before, he's probably not on the same level in terms of his status as, as Werner and, uh, and Havertz. Clean sweep with Werner. I'm going to go Werner as well, man. He looked sharp yesterday. I saw him against uh, Spain the other day, tore them up. But you know what? I, I spoke to Frank the other day about um, Zayek. And he said, 
his passing is ridiculous. He said, like, and like, I'm looking to see them passes when he cuts in on his left foot. And Mason Mount, Werner, Havertz, etc., all making runs. And this guy, I think, would be putting stuff on a plate for you boys. Who are your top four? Let's go. Um, uh, I'll, uh, I'll go first. Um, is this in no particular order? I want it in order. I want pressure. Oh, <laughs> um, um, Liverpool and City to tie on points. <laughs> Top. Yeah. And then in third place, I reckon it's going to be Chelsea. They're going to kick on. And then in fourth place... I'm on Arsenal. No, nah, uh, I don't know if it's going to be. Uh, is it going to be Arsenal? Yeah, go on then. Yeah, I'll give it to Arsenal. Yeah, I'll give fourth place to Arsenal. They're back, they're what back am I into hearing, the top bro? four. Hey, Cal, what am I hearing? What, is this rival <laughs> with between Man United and Liverpool gone a bit far? <laughs> no, no, brother. I, I'm sorry, but I need... I hope Fernandez doesn't do what he did towards the end of last season. I don't need that in my life. Uh, you know, everybody doing a little too well for my liking towards the end there. So, um, yeah, Arsenal, they, but they're going to need to they're going to need to pull something out of the bag to get that top four spot. But um, we'll see. Joe? It's got to be... For me, Man City are going to win the league this year. I think the lack of Liverpool's, um, I'll say, thrust in the transfer market will end up biting them. So, but second, I reckon Liverpool um, will come runners up. Uh, I don't think it's going to be by much, right? Third, yes, it's got to be Chelsea. It's got to be Chelsea, man. Um, those new signings. Fourth, come on, man. It's got to be up. <laughs> you know I mean? Well, we asked, you saw us, listen, our armpits, FA Cup, <laughs> Community Shield. Oh, God. We've got a flow going, man. Cal knows. Cal knows. No, it was it was either it was either that or United, but um, I just I, I the fact is I just don't want United to top four, so I'm speaking it into existence. Cal, I'm speaking it into know, existence. I'll have Arsenal top four. I don't know if you're going back on again, bro. The hate playing United too much. Uh, I'll go. Obviously, I, I think um, I think City will do it. Uh, Liverpool close, close behind, but yeah, unless they sign big in the in the next month. Um, a couple of the players, then they probably can win the league again. But as it stands, yeah, City, Liverpool, Chelsea, and Spurs. Spurs, oh, come on, man. Boss. Hey, look at, all I would on. say, all, look, look, I would say, look, everybody, it, the, the, no one's rating us this season, right? We haven't made big, big, big signings. But look at the points amassed under Jose Mourinho when he's had Harry Kane and Hummin Son in the side. Look, just go and have it. Look it up. I'm going. <laughs> man City, Liverpool, close. Man United. Chelsea. That's where I'm going. Sorry, boys. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> we didn't touch on Man United, man. And then I know, obviously, you guys are choosing not to speak about Man United. It's fine. But I've got to bring them up. Because Incredible. The biggest pub on the planet. Incredible. <laughs> Incredible. I talk about United. I don't talk about United and most United fans do anyway, bro. You know what I mean? I, I think it's amazing. It's amazing. What, like, so if you'd have told me that Solskjaer would have mastered the season, I would have called you crazy. I thought you was out of his depth. He's done nothing to, 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 to get that job. I don't know, still know how he got the job in the first instance. And look what he's done. Look, he bought in one player and his entire system clicked into gear. They're scoring goals. They've got um, an incredible youth talent coming through. Uh, actually, he, he, isn't even, he wouldn't even call him a prospect anymore. You know, he's starting next, next year. We would. You've got to give Solskjaer props. And, and you know, like it, my heart, I said that Spurs will finish um, fourth. But the reality is that it'll probably be United because look at what they did since Bruno Fernandes came in. I like you, Flav. I like you. Word. No, I, got, I don't even want to agree, but I've got to back, back you on that one, Flav. Like yeah. with Bruno Fernandes FC, it's a madness out there. I'm telling you. I'm Get telling out of here, man. Double penalties and they'll, 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 they'll be challenging for the league. But yes, honestly, yeah, that front three at the end of last season, yeah, when you see the FA Cup final, yeah, I was praying. I was praying that it weren't Man United. I was just like, give me Chelsea all day long because the way Martial all of a sudden found form, all of a sudden he, kicked, you know, he was in gear and obviously Rashford and you know what I mean Greenwood. I was scared, man. Like, and I feel like Solskjaer, credit as well. Scared. Real I like that. You're scared. scared yeah, no, I was. I was. <laughs> now, prior to prior to that Valencia game, yeah, I was shook in that. It's still, I can't lie. I mean, well, no, not even Valencia. So Seville. Prior to that Seville game, I, I was shook for United, but. I'll be honest with you, when I look at um, what Oli has done, credit to him, because I, I wasn't sure if he was going to last the season, and you said he would, Rio. Do you reckon Sancho changes everything for Man United? Is it, is it, is it that big a signing for Man United, guys? Yes. 
It's a yeah. lot of money. <laughs> you, you've got another uh, he's quality. Why wouldn't you want him? You, yeah, yeah. He's, he, he, it adds something. It means you're competitive think... across every competition. If you've got four four forwards that can all play, could it be spent elsewhere and strengthen the team? Maybe you know defense. But yeah. it's Sancho. You got if you've got the opportunity to buy him, you buy him. It's no question. Yeah, have you seen my man's stats from the Bundesliga? The guy who do stuff that doesn't... Even right now, where his head should be gone, he should be a player that is distracted, not playing well, coach, I don't want to play. Did you see him over the, the course when he just played? Scott at the weekend. Scott at the weekend. Do you know he's the only English player for I don't know how many years it is to get 15 goals and 15 assists in a season? Yeah. For like about for, for the last like eight years or something like that, it's crazy. The, the kid's got mad talent. I need I need him at Man United, please. I'm begging. And I'm, I'm know, almost begging. And do you know what? I, else? Hope it, I hope it doesn't happen, anyways. So I was gonna say, frankly, <laughs> like, because you know, very close friends of friends and that with him. And one thing that we've all said is that his focus is he, he is one of the most focused youngsters you'll ever meet ever in your life. And that, for me, changes it all. If it doesn't happen this summer, it will happen next summer. Mm. Well, fingers crossed, man. I need it this summer. But anyway, listen, guys, I really appreciate your time. The first one we've had, really appreciate it. Listen, brilliant. And I'll see you again soon, man. Nice one. Pleasure, Cheers, mate. guys. Cheers, boys. Cheers. 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 Thank you so much, guys. We got through so much there. Click the link here to subscribe. Make sure you do that. Do not miss that button. Click on it. Listen, we'll see you again next time. Thanks to the special guest. Cheerio.